Hey everybody, this is our weekly video. We're going to talk about uh, crime and uh, car incarceration this week. Last week we talked about uh, crime and deviance more broadly as in uh, the, the sort of lighter side of deviance or the, the less serious side of deviance. So we're, we're looking at, um, and particularly in our, in our deviance assignment that we've got coming up, that's due March 22nd. Um, we're going to violate an informal norm, right? And we're going to see how these informal norms are sort of policed and enforced and uh, sanctioned um, within within our population. So that's done real subtly, right? Um, when you when you do something that just seems odd or weird or funny or just that's not normal, right? Um, you'll get a reaction from other people, and we're looking at those reactions and we're seeing uh, how those reactions discourage you from doing that at doing whatever you were doing again right um so that's what we're looking at with from last week for with with deviants more broadly now we're looking more specifically at the criminal aspect of deviants um so before we get into that let me just do a couple of quick course announcements um we have our course evaluations are open now those are really important give me some feedback uh, all your instructors, give them all feedback. It's really important. This, the, you know, the, the college exists for students, um, so it's really important that students' voices are heard um, on how they feel the classes are going and how they feel uh, their instruction could improve. It's really, it's just a, a really important philosophical thing, right? Like we need students to uh, tell us how they feel their education is going. It's really important. So. Um, Please get that done. I've got an, uh, all the information is uh, in, a, in a Blackboard announcement, um, and I've uh, sent an email out to you. So you should have all the information that you need to get that done. So don't don't wait. Go ahead and get that knocked out as quick as you can. Um, again, we have our deviance assignment that's due a week from Sunday. I'm giving you a little extra time on that so you can think about it. If you're having trouble coming up with anything or if you're unsure about what to do or you have some ideas that you're not sure if they're cool, First of all, if you're not sure, it's probably best to just think of something different, right? Be sure, be confident that what you're going to do is not going to get you in trouble. Um, but if you do have any questions, of course, reach out to me. Let me know. I'd be happy to help. Um, and beyond that, uh, I think we're ready to get started. Um, well, no, let me tell you, I, I, I've fallen behind in your, in your grading, um, but I'm going to get that caught up. Uh, uh, by the end of the day on Wednesday. I've got all my other stuff cleared off as soon as I finish my my class in the in the morning. Uh, all I've got to do in the afternoon is get all caught up on your on your on the grades for this class. So I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna get it done by by the end of the day on Wednesday. All right. So that's where we're at there. Um, by the way, I touch my face a lot. We're not supposed to do that because of all the, the, the virus stuff. Do you realize how much you touch your face? Like I see when I when I see myself in the video, it's when I realize how often I'm, I am scratch my beard constantly. And, uh, all right, I'm rambling. Um, so we're going to talk about crime and punishment or crime and incarceration, how we punish or uh, police crime in our in our country and in our society. Um, and I got to tell you a little bit about my perspective on this. Um, my last job before coming over here to Beaufort was working at a, a county jail in Tennessee where I worked with a reentry program um, where we provide services to inmates uh, to um, hopefully reduce recidivism, right? So when people are released from jail uh, or prison, they're released from a time of incarceration. We, we don't want them to come back, right? We want them to be able to hold down a job, um, get uh, mental health or addiction treatment as needed um, and, you know, live a nice, happy, productive life uh, outside of the walls of a, of a detention center. Um, so I, I worked in that field for a little while um, and uh, found it pretty rewarding. But um, that, that, anyway, that's my perspective on it. Um, so I just have to know, I, have to, I just feel the need to, to note that before we get started. Because um, we all have our opinions, we have our emotions, we have our feelings. Um, in a sociology class, we try to be what we call value-free, right? We're not trying to make value judgments on, on particular issues. We're just sort of studying the situation as it is. 
Um, but um, we can't help. We can't help it. Our opinions, our beliefs, our perspectives, our feelings, they do get wrapped up into what we do. Uh, and that's okay. Uh, the most important thing to do uh, to help control for that is to just start by acknowledging your perspective, knowing where you come from. And I come from a place where I uh, uh, worked in a jail and um, just uh, developed good relationships with people who were who, who were incarcerated. And they were, and I didn't get everybody's backstory. I never asked, but you know, a lot of times it, they would share. And uh, you know, most of the people I worked with, I fully agree, deserved to be incarcerated. They had done some bad things. They made they had made mistakes or. Um, you know, just for whatever reason or for whatever they had done, they had, uh, they had done something they deserved. They deserved to be, be locked up or to be punished in some way. Um, but, you know, I, I came to care about them and hope that they wouldn't make those same mistakes um, again. So anyway, that's my perspective. That's where we're at. Um, so uh, let's we'll forge on ahead. I got a little, I got a presentation that we're going to go through. So we're still in our chapter on deviance, but we're focusing specifically on the criminal aspect of, of deviance. So we're crime and deviance part two, crime and punishment, uh, or well, crime and incarceration. I stole crime and punishment from I think a pretty famous author. Um, so, but first let's review the relationship between criminality and deviance, right? Most criminal behavior is also deviant behavior, but there's all sorts of behavior that is deviant or violates social norms that is not criminal, right? That's largely harmless. Um, or it, could, it can be harmful, but it's, it's not illegal. Um, so again, your, your deviance assignments are focused on, on this area of deviant behavior, these, these kind of harmless things that are just weird or odd. Um, and now we're going to focus more on the, on the criminal behavior. And our purpose in this class, again, is more on the reactions to, to deviance and criminality than on the uh, actions themselves. Now we do have some theories in our chapter that we dis that, that the book discussed, um, like social control theory and strain theory that really does ask the question about uh, why people commit crime or why people uh, engage in deviant behaviors or deviant lifestyles. Um, and, and those are important questions to ask, but uh, in, in our purposes, I think for an intro to sociology class, I want to focus more on the reactions to the deviants and reactions to the to the criminal behavior. Um, so, yeah, 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 that's, that's, that's where we're at there. That's what I want to say there. So again, uh, when we're talking about deviance, uh, we've got to talk about norms, right? We define deviance by things that go against our, our social norms. Um, and we've got a couple different kinds of norms that we've discussed, right? Formal norms and informal norms. All of our criminal behavior, everything, whoops, Everything in this circle is uh, violating a formal norm. Uh, so that means it's a norm that has been codified. Now, there are some things that are deviant, but not criminal, that are still violating formal norms. And the best example of that is like an official workplace policy or an official school policy, right? Our academic uh, dishonesty policy um, is written, right? So that's the idea with, with formal norms. They are written down. They are documented. There's something you can point to, you can look at, you can read, and you can see it says in plain language that you're not supposed to do this, and this is what will happen if you do do this. Um, so those are formal norms. That's the idea. That's what separates a formal norm from an informal norm is that documentation. Um, so informal norms, again, they are enforced informally. So that's what we're looking at in our deviance assignment, right? We are looking at how uh, people react to violating these informal norms or these folk ways um, to sort of en enforce what's normal in society. So, um, yeah, I mean, if, if you go out uh, wearing a costume in the middle of March, nowhere near Halloween, and uh, it's not a costume related to St. Patrick's Day, then yeah, you might get some funny looks and those those actions and the funny looks and the funny reactions that you get um, might serve to discourage you from doing that again. Uh, so that's the idea. That's what we're looking at with informal norms and informal enforcement that's much more subtle, typically. 
Um, now, formal norms have formal enforcement, right? So again, it's codified. So we, we know what's going to happen if you violate this policy or this procedure or this law. There's something that's written down that you can point to, that you can look at, that you can read that says, this is what's going to happen if I violate this formal norm. Uh, so criminal behavior, again, violates a law, right? So that means the, what defines a law from other kinds of formal formal norms is that it's codified by a government entity, entity a, a legislative body, whether it's the county level, the state level, or the national level. Some government body has uh, submitted legislation that has made this particular behavior illegal and has recommended appropriate responses by the state or by the, the, the uh, you know, that institution, the institution of the government, the institution of the state, uh, has a response ready for that action. Um, so, uh, that's, that's it. And very often, the response to violating the law comes in the form of incarceration. Um, so we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about incarceration and what we hope to achieve from it. So this is the question of why do we incarcerate? And it's something that's so ingrained in our society. We've talked about the idea of social structures and social institutions, something that are so ingrained in our culture and in our society that we don't even really question it anymore, right? We, we, we think that incarceration is sort of self-evident. We don't know what else we would do uh, to respond to criminal acts. It's, it's just, it is, it is what we do. It's, like I've said, it's, it's, it's the best idea we've come up with uh, so far. Um, so it's, but it's important uh, to at some point ask why we incarcerate and what we hope to gain from incarceration. And uh, we had that short reading where they misspelled deserts. And I was really disappointed in Cliff's notes for that, but they spelled just deserts. And it should have been just desserts. Anyway, retribution, just desserts, not just deserts. Um, the retribution is the idea that we're dealing with a, a, a morality. It's punishment for punishment's sake. It's, it's punishment because you're angry at this person and you feel it's morally right to make them suffer some sort of unpleasant consequence uh, for their behavior. Uh, deterrence is the idea that by doing this, uh, we're going to prevent future law breaking, not just from the person who is uh, punished, but from <clears throat> excuse me, from people who see that person being punished. So uh, the key to deterrence is the three S's. It should be swift, severe, and certain. And I know certain doesn't actually begin with S, but it, it alliterates. Um, swift, severe, certain. That's the, the theory behind deterrence. As long as it's those three things, as long as it happens soon after the act as long as it's severe enough to serve as, a, as, as an appropriate threat, and as long as it's certain, as long as the idea that you are going to be punished for this in this way, uh, as long as you're certain of that fact, um, then it would be an effective deterrent. That's the theory behind it. And then we have incapacitation. That's the idea that we're gonna lock dangerous people away from the rest of society. Um, and And again, that's just, protecting society, the wider society, from sort of particularly dangerous people. Um, that's the idea of incapacitation. And then finally, there's rehabilitation. That's the idea that you're going to affect some sort of change in the behavior of an offender. Um, and so those are our four basic theories. Um, and I want to do a little video now that's going to reiterate some of that. America has a hefty prisoner problem on its hands. Well, well over two million, million individuals, individuals fill America's jails, with the cost of mass incarceration taking a huge 80 plus billion dollar bite out of the country's annual budget. How did we become the world's leading jailer with the highest prison population rate on the planet? Things were not always this way. U.S. prisons are called penitentiaries and correctional facilities because they were originally intended as a tool to rehabilitate offenders, enabling them to regret and abandon their mistakes and to rejoin society fairly quickly. Keeping people locked up was not a goal in itself. This historically optimistic attitude took a nosedive in the early 1970s as the rehabilitation theories guiding the criminal justice system crumbled in the face of new research. 
According to the latest scientific conclusions of the time, rehabilitation was ineffective and nothing could be done to prevent criminals from reoffending. I looked at all the methods that we could find, vocational, educational, and a variety of other methods. These methods simply have no fundamental effect on the recidivism rate of people who go through those prisons, who go through the system as a whole, even. probation, prison, and parole, and so forth. No effect at all. No effect. No basic effect. Professor Robert Martinson of the City University of New York did not reach those conclusions casually. He is the first sociologist ever to do a comprehensive study of prison rehabilitation programs. As a result, practical policy swung in favor of other punishment theories, primarily retribution and incapacitation. Keeping people behind bars for lengthy periods now became a goal of the justice system. And by 1983, every state but Wisconsin adopted mandatory minimum sentencing laws, effectively incarcerating prisoners for far longer periods. Congress joined the mandatory minimum bandwagon in 1984 with its Sentencing Reform Act and also eliminated federal parole, ensuring that federal prisoners could no longer be freed early before completing their full sentences. Many states enacted three-strike laws for repeat offenders, mandating life in prison after three convictions that include at least some serious or violent offenses. Take the case of a petty thief who was sentenced in California to life imprisonment after his third run-in with the law. In this case, Leandro Andrade was given not one, but two sentences of 25 years to life for stealing nine children's videotapes the tapes were worth $153.54. Sentences like these guaranteed to fill our prisons for decades to come with perpetrators of relatively minor crimes. We can trace the United States prison population explosion to specific dates. Between 1925 and 1972, the numbers were fairly stable. But between 1972 and the year 2000, they catapulted from 300,000 inmates to over 2 million, more than a six-fold jump. And the rate of incarceration per 100,000 Americans more than quadrupled, from 160 to over 700. That's an awful lot of people behind bars. It's similar to locking up the entire population of the state of Kansas. This surge was fueled primarily by changing emphasis in theories of punishment. We moved from seeking ways to rehabilitate offenders to seeking ways to penalize them or simply remove them from society, in which case decades in jail certainly fits the bill. Our perspectives, however, are coming full circle. Current punitive theories are abandoning the belief in tit-for-tat prison sentences. The classic studies that have discredited rehabilitation efforts have themselves been dismissed, and fresh research holds out new hope for rehabilitative programs. Even Robert Martinson walked back his nothing works conclusion. Government policy, however, has been slow to catch on. Politicians stand little to gain from instituting real change to the justice system. The public benefits are not immediately tangible to their constituents, and they are wary of appearing to be soft on crime. Until the day we allow what we know to influence what we do, the yawning gate of So the video got a little bit preachy there, so I wanted to just cut that off again. We're not, we're not trying to make value judgments here uh, or, or get emotional about things. We just want to look at the, the situation as, as it is. So... Um, but that was, but but I but I like that video because it takes you through the history and, and includes these different theories of punishment and incarceration, what we hope to gain from them, um, and um, how historically there are, our emphases have shifted uh, from what we hope to gain from incarceration. Um, so this next part, I think, if if you remember back, I and mean, I don't think we both we dwelled on this too much in our in our video, but I know, and, and I think in the first chapter. Um, when we talked about when functionalism was first presented uh, as a perspective, we talked about or the book talked about latent, latent and manifest functions. So manifest functions are the functions that you hope that you do on purpose, and latent functions are things that happen on accident, right? That that, that are just sort of unintended consequences 
unintended functions of of certain social patterns and social structures. So uh, one of the key latent functions of uh, our mass incarceration and our incarceration system is uh, the idea that there's a lot of money to be made from incarceration, right? Um, a lot of people will argue that keeping people in jails or prisons is good for business. And for a lot of companies, it is good for business because uh, all of our prisons, our jails, they, they include all sorts of different services, um, whether it's your, your phone minutes. That's an outside company that, that, charge, that overcharges, right? I mean, you know, you're, you're charged more to talk on the phone when you're incarcerated than any other place where you could possibly talk on the phone. Um, food, right? While you get, well, you're, you're provided basic meals. Uh, if you want anything extra, if you want yeah, and, and any, anything extra, if you want an extra pillow, an extra blanket, uh, an extra bag of chips, a, a cup of noodles, anything like that, that comes from commissary. And again, that's handled by another company, another private company that makes a lot of money. Uh, the more people who are incarcerated, right? Um, uh, and so there's lots of examples of this. Um, and wait, we're not there yet. Um, so we want to talk about how jails or prisons, incarceration is, is good for some businesses. Um, and so they have a, a distinct uh, motivation to keep people incarcerated. And again, we're going to watch another video now that comes from uh, the, the television program, Adam Ruins Everything. And Adam gets on my nerves, man. I mean, it's a little bit obnoxious, but I, I think it, it's, uh, yeah, it's a nice change of pace and it's obviously a better production value and what I can do. Um, so it's going to go through and again, you're going to hear the, this, this same analogy about how our prison population is like the size of a state. Uh, so anyway, that, that might get a little bit redundant. But anyway, it's, it's worth pointing out how people are making money off the incarceration system. And again, the, you're going to get you're going to see in this video that they try to kind of make some value judgments on it and they try to sort of uh, encourage you to feel a certain way about it. And again, I don't want you to get involved in that. I just want you to look at the facts and just try to steal your emotions and try to keep the emotion out of it and just kind of look at the situation for what it is. Um, again, we're not looking for bad people. I say this all the time in sociology classes. We are not out looking for bad people doing bad things. So, uh, you know, this video is going to try to throw shade on a company, um, but the company is just, it, 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 it's, the problem is uh, not in, in the company itself, but it's in the system, right? They're just they're they're taking advantage of a system that exists, and um, don't get mad at you know. I don't know. I hate to go back to that old adage, but you know, don't hate the player, hate the game, right? So don't hate this company for for having a good business model. Hate the system that allows this business model to be so lucrative. Anyway, that's a lot of preamble. Let's just watch this video. You got me into this? No, you get me out. I promise, I have someone working on it. But in the meantime, this is a great opportunity to explain why our nation's prison system is a failure on every level. <laughs> so you know a lot about prison? I bet you watch a lot of CBS documentaries, huh? Yes, you're right. I do like first-hand knowledge. Oh, maybe you could help me do this episode? Sure. Nothing better to do. Whoa, do you have magic TV powers like Adam? Nope. nope. I got a lot of favors. Early lunch today. Early lunch today, everyone. America's prison system is a total mess. Whatever purpose you think it serves, it ain't doing it. Well, the point of prison is to reduce crime. It's definitely not doing that. There are 2.2 million people incarcerated in the U.S. Ten times more than 50 years ago. Two million is more than the population of some states. Welcome to Mass Incarceration of Massachusetts. Our primary export? Shiz. Our secondary export? God. Hey! That's contraband! <laughs> but despite this massive increase in the prison population, a study conducted by the NYU School of Law found that the effect on the crime rate has been essentially zero. Another smooth edit, so I can just jump in here. I want to just uh, 
talk about what, one of the one of the main things that I don't want you to get out of a, of a sociology class like this is the ability to be a, a responsible and knowledgeable consumer of knowledge, right? So the study that you're seeing there is very similar to the study that we read, right? And so this one study by the NYU School of Law is corroborated by other studies by institutes such, such as the Vera Institute that we that we uh, had a couple of readings from this week. Um, and and, and the, the point that I just want to make here is that uh, when you see information like this, uh, you see it cited. When you watch Adam Ruins Everything, if you watch Adam Ruins Everything, um, you'll see that they, they, they cite their sources. They cite where they're getting their information from. Um, and so I encourage you all when you're when you're seeing things like that, when you're just when you're when you're reading, when you're watching things, um, go to the study, go look at the study. You're smart enough. You're intelligent enough. You can go and look at how that data was gathered, how it was analyzed and how they reached their conclusions. So don't just again, you know, I mean, this is a short television show, so they got to they got to pack a lot in. So they're not going to unpack uh, how that study was conducted. They just kind of c- cite that you know the the effect of uh, increasing incarceration has been effectively zero in terms of crime rates so um we in an academic course like this we have the opportunity we have the time and we actually have sort of the imperative to go and, and learn more about how these studies were conducted and to take sort of a, a a skeptical view and ask the question well how did they reach that conclusion and then we can go we can look at that study and we can uh and we can evaluate how well it was conducted. Um, and as it turns out, you know, these studies, A, they're corroborated by other studies, right? So it's not just one study that's showing this. There are several studies that show this trend. And um, as we saw in the reading, it's we, we can we can evaluate the methods and um, how, the, how they came to their conclusions and find um, that it's these are these are pretty valid conclusions. All right, I'm off my soapbox. Now let's watch the rest of this. Bro. Girl. And why do we lock so many people up? Well, I can't speak for all prisons, but this one is here to make money. Make money? You mean someone is profiting from all this? Yep, these guys are. It all started in the tough on crime 80s, when the war on drugs meant state and federal prisons were bursting at the seams. So many prisoners, what do we do? Let corporate America handle your prisons. We'll take care of everything. Save you a few bucks and skim a little off the top. With businesses running prisons? That sounds a little fishy. (laughs) Just kidding. I mean, hey, if it saves money, right? (laughs) And so the Corrections Corporation of America, or CCA, was born. Okay, hold on. You can't just sell prisons like they're cars or real estate or hamburgers. Now, why don't you tell that to Tom Beasley, the co-founder of CCA, who once said, you just sell prisons like you were selling cars or real estate or hamburgers. I'll have a number seven with uh, extra solitary cells, electric fence, and uh, small onion rings. Yeah, super max And they rake in a ton of scratch. Last year, CCA took in $1.7 billion. This is so good, it's criminal. <laughs> Well, you know, maybe it's okay because they're saving the taxpayer money. (laughs) Sorry, the sales pitch was wrong. The data shows that private prisons cost the taxpayers just as much as regular prisons. And today, nearly one-fifth of federal prisoners are held in a for-profit facility. Okay. Ah, graffiti. That's an infraction. A beautiful one. Are you Banksy? Oh, my gosh. I've already gotten a fraction? That's given a lot of these. Oh, yeah. That's not a coincidence. One study showed that private prisons dole out twice as many infractions as government prisons. Not having enough infractions. That's an infraction. These penalties can lengthen your sentence, which earns the company even more cash. Oh, so the more people that are in prison, the more money they make. Ooh, that's dirty. Yep, that's why private prisons sneak occupancy clauses into their contracts, which actually require states to keep prisons full. Last year, a private prison in Arizona didn't make their 97% capacity quota, so the state government had to pay them a $3 million fine. Fines like that incentivize cash-trapped states to keep people in prison as long as possible. Your parole forms are in order, and you've been a model prisoner. So we're going to lock you back up. We really can't afford to pay another fine. That's reprehensible. Look, not all prisons are private prisons, but this one is. So no, its purpose isn't to stop crime. It's the dollar dollar bills, y'all. <laughs> Woo. 
so yeah, a little bit uh, obnoxious on that video, but um, you know, it's still a little entertaining, more entertaining than uh, probably just looking at me or watching words and listening to my voice. So hopefully uh, the change of pace is nice. Um, and it does cite uh, good studies, good information. Um, but again, I want you to make your own sort of uh, judgments on that, make your own evaluations as to who you're, who you're, I mean, if you want to get mad at anybody, um, whether you're mad at a company or whether you're mad at a system or whether you think it's perfectly fine and uh, appropriate, um, uh, whatever the case may be, we are just simply looking at the, uh, at, at the reality of the incarceration system. Now, um, I'm touching my face again. This happens a lot. Um, so our next, our next thing, the next question that we want to ask is about who we are locking up, right? Who are we putting in jail? What communities they come from? There's an idea that's called the uh, the community concentration of crime. They call it the wall of, of crime concentration in, in criminal justice fields. And that's the idea that most of the arrests, not most of the crime. And again, this is, this is, that's a really important point to make. And I should have probably put a, some words to this effect, but um, arrests and crime rates are not the same, right? There are lots of crimes that happen every day that do not result in arrests. So when we look at the crime concentration, the law of crime concentration that says that most crime occurs in specific areas or specific neighborhoods, that's a little bit inaccurate. It's just that most of the arrests occur in these neighborhoods. If you go back to your reading and you look at um, the issues that the reading from last week from the chapter in the textbook, um, the the issues with the uh, Uniform Crime Report, the FBI's UCR Uniform Crime Report, uh, the issues is that only measures uh, arrests, right? Crimes that are um, that result that result in arrests, um, and so when we have the National Victimization Survey, that is generally a better indicator of actually how much crime is being committed and not just how much crime is being arrested. When we look at the, uh, the, the victimization survey results, it looks a little different than, than the uh, UCR report. Um, anyway, that's a little caveat. But the point is, most of the arrests happen within one city, about 50% of the arrests, generally speaking, within one city, in big cities, about 50% of the arrests are going to occur in about where 4% of the population lives. So these are these high crime areas, high crime concentrated areas. Um, and invariably, those neighborhoods um, are inhabited by mostly non-white people. Uh, so when we talk about mass incarceration, mass incarceration has decimated those communities, those neighborhoods. You, you put a lot of families apart uh, in, in that process. And again, it's it's real nuanced here, right? It can, on a case by case basis, there are probably plenty of people in jail. I mean, you know, there are plenty of people in jail who deserve to be there, who deserve to to uh, be incarcerated. Um, but we also just have to look at the larger effect of what's happening when you're pulling, you know, a third of young black men uh, out of their homes and out of their families and away from um, their neighborhoods and out of the job market. You're losing tax base. You're losing family structure, you're losing all sorts of um, social bonds, right? Um, and so it's particularly impacting African-American communities. And so our our discussion board focuses on that for this week. And there's also the 13th documentary that's on Netflix that you can watch for extra credit. Um, I we, That's the documentary that we showed on campus uh, last week and, or I guess, I guess not two weeks ago. Um, but... Only only one of you showed up for that one, and I appreciate I appreciate the person that did. I didn't get to speak to you, but I saw your name on the sign in sheet, so I appreciate you coming. Um, uh, for the rest of you that weren't able to make it, um, the documentary is available on Netflix, and you can just post a little uh, write up of what you thought about it, um, and just kind of you know I don't know prove to me that you actually watched it and thought about it. Um, and then also our discussion board for this week touches on the issue of race, gender, and social class and in mass incarceration. That again, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm getting, I got a frog in my throat. Um, so mass incarceration has particularly affected uh, 
particular demographic, and that is young men of color who are largely undereducated or from poor communities. So you've got social class, you've got gender, and you've got race that are all uh, coming together and that's who's being most impacted and those are the communities that are being most impacted by this trend of mass incarceration. Um, so that is what we are looking at with our discussion board and with the extra credit assignment uh, that is currently available. Now we will talk more about all three of those, as I, and I mentioned this in the discussion board. Sometimes it's really difficult when we're talking about um, social problems, right? And there's a whole class, the next sociology class, Sociology 220 at the community college level, is a class called Social Problems. And it's really hard to divorce one social problem from another social problem. So problems associated with mass incarceration are invariably linked to these problems associated with race, class, gender. The problems of race are not independent from the problems associated with gender. The problems in social class are not independent from the problems of mass incarceration or the problems of um, violence or misogyny. All of these things are interrelated, so it's hard to just pull them apart and, and examine them one thing at a time. So that's what I'm hoping that we'll, we'll get across in the, in the discussion board for the week. Some of you have probably already taken a look at that. Um, but it, it, all these things are interrelated. Right? You, you can't really disentangle them. Um, and in fact, the, the more questions you ask, the more you peel back the layers, the more you see how these issues are intertwined. Um, and it actually makes things a little bit more complicated, maybe a lot more complicated. All right, next I want to introduce us to this idea of recidivism. And again, we had a, this was covered in our reading, but recidivism is the idea of how many people will relapse into criminal behavior after becoming justice involved. Um, and so that's that's a real broad definition, right? Relapsing into criminal behavior, again, how do you measure that? Uh, because we got to rely on on arrests, right? So we, we can only measure recidivism by uh, if they're rearrested after a period of being justice involved. And we say justice involved because we also have recidivism rates for not just people who were incarcerated, but people who have been uh, had had diverted sentences like I, I have things like probation. Or, uh, or or community corrections. Um, so it's just how many times they've been involved in the justice system uh, and then become involved again or are rearrested after that. Um, so recidivism is tougher to measure than it should be, right? I mean, you got to look at how long after release are you measuring. So within one year, your recidivism rates are one thing. After three years, after nine years, there was a 2015 report that showed that 83% of the people they studied, that they followed, that were released from prison in 2005 had been arrested again by 2014. That's 83%. That's a nine-year recidivism rate of 83%. Um, and again, that's not a national sample. That's not, you can't say that, you know, you can't take that number all the way to the bank, that it's a, the nationally 83% of people who are released from prison uh, will be rearrested within nine years. But um you do the best you can. You take a sample from across 30 states, and that's that's a large trend, right? This was a huge report by by the Pew Research Center, and um, it studied a lot of people. It was a, a well-funded study, um, but it's complicated, right? So how how were all these measures? Who all was included? Arrest doesn't necessarily equal convicted, right? So what was the result of those arrests? Usually, as soon as you are arrested and put back in jail. Uh, you, you're, you're counted as a recidivist, right? What happens if those charges are then dropped or if those charges that arrest in one way or another doesn't result in a conviction? That person still is counted as a recidivist. Um, so uh, who were parole violations? Those are, those are real tricky too, right? Because um, you can be, you can violate your parole uh, for little things, not necessarily criminal acts, but just violating certain terms of the agreement. Um, if you get, if you lose your job, you can be rearrested. If you um, are it, it, on a certain level of supervision, you can be rearrested for being for missing curfew if you're at a halfway house um, or a transitional house, we call them now. Um, but yeah, these these it's very easy 
uh, to be arrested on a parole violation when you're when you're on parole. There's this idea um, that was real common in the jail that I worked in where people wanted to um, go flat. They wanted to flatten their time. And the idea behind flat time was that you would spend a little more time in the jail being incarcerated. And that way, when you're released, uh, you're you're not on parole. You get to, you're released. You're not on paper, as, as they say. Um, and that was and, and that's just a preventative measure that's to try to so that when they get out, they're not worried about being rearrested. Uh, if they get a speeding ticket or um, if they fail a drug test, which yeah, I mean, I knew a couple of guys who didn't have any plans on uh, going back into deep criminal behavior. But they were they were they wanted to be able to smoke a little pot. So they stayed in jail a little bit longer. So they weren't on parole when they got out. So they could just, you know, smoke some pot when they get it out. Uh, you can make your own value judgment on that. Um, but anyway, uh, that's parole violations, probation violations. And also, it's hard to measure, and I learned this firsthand, it's hard to measure recidivism at the county level. Because again, as we learned in, our, in, our, in one of our readings, a large percentage, most of the people who are in a jail, in a county jail, are awaiting trial. They haven't been convicted of anything yet, so they're they're pre-trial detainees. Um, so, yeah, I had one person in my jail who uh, who was who was in the jail for six, seven months, and then their charges were dropped. So, um, I wasn't sure how, whether or not to include that person in my uh, recidivism report. Um, I, but, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a judgment call. I ended up including them because they had spent time in the facility and they did do some some of our classes. So I, I wanted to track that person and know if they got rearrested. But again, if they got rearrested in another county, I wouldn't necessarily know about that. We, we'd have to go and then scour their records. And so, yeah, I mean, if you go out of state, I'm, I'll I'll never know. I'll never know if people in my program get rearrested in a, in, in a state other than Tennessee. Uh, anyway, so I'm, 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 I'm rambling a little bit, but just measuring recidivism is, is more challenging than it should be. So when you look at recidivism rates, uh, again, be a responsible and intelligent discerner of information. Uh, look at the methods, look at how they're measuring and what all they're including. Uh, so recidivism cycles, and I, I, I touched on this a little bit with the idea of, of probation and parole violations, but you can get stuck in this cycle of recidivism. Um, in Tennessee, if you, you'll have your license revoked uh, once you're once you once you become incarcerated, your license is revoked until you pay all of your restitution and fees. Um, so when you are released, you are released without a license until you're all paid up to to the county or the state. Um, which, if you live in a rural area, gets really tricky, right? Because you've got to drive to get to work when they don't have public transportation, uh, and the public transportation they do have is wrapped up in the healthcare system. Uh, getting people to doctor's appointments and such. They're not taking people to work. So you got to find a way to get to work. If you can even get a job, which is tricky with, with a criminal record, but if you can even get a job, uh, you got to get to that job in order to make the money to pay back your restitution. And I had a lot of people get rearrested on par parole or probation violations uh, because they were they were pulled over while they were driving to work. And again, in a small county like that, it's hard to get away with it because all the deputies who know all the people who have been in jail a couple of times and, you know, they say, well, there goes Zach Meeks. I know he just got out of jail a couple of weeks ago and there he is driving around. I'm pretty sure he doesn't have his license back. So let's pull him over and check. Sure enough, he doesn't. And that, but that becomes a, a quick parole violation and he's back in jail. So um, these are what we call recidivism cycles. You can get stuck in these cycles of recidivism and it's, and it's hard to break out of it. It's, it gets really hard to break out of it, which is why some people just, again, they decide they're going to stay in jail a little bit longer so that when they get out, they, they don't have to be on probation to try to avoid that that cycle. Um, all right, that's another little spiel. So as, our, as the second video we watched noted, there is a shift. So we had a shift away from rehabilitation uh, from the 19th century and early 20th century our, our emphasis shifted away from rehabilitation and more to incapacitation or even retribution. Um, and now we're starting to shift back to rehabilitation and we, we're, we're seeing it arise in the, uh, 
the idea of reentry programs or programs that are uh, connecting people who have been arrested or become justice involved to services that they need, right? So again, where we're dealing with uh, addiction services, mental health treatment, uh, job skills training and education. Um, so these are what we call reentry programs. And reentry programs are w- one of the remarkable places that in our country actually has bipartisan support. So I've got one last video. It's real short. It's just a couple of minutes. That's going to demonstrate that uh, this is this is one of the few issues in our country that sort of everybody is kind of on, on the same page. Or most people are on the same page, but Republicans and Democrats, they get along on this. Maybe there's some differing opinions on how exactly to go about it, but both sides seem to agree that uh, we need a better, we need more emphasis on, on re-entry, on rehabilitation, on providing uh, inmates and arrestees access to services, to, to treatment, to addiction treatment, mental health treatment, job skills, education services, all those things. Um, and that's what reentry programs do. So here's our, here's our last little video. President Trump today signed a sweeping criminal justice overhaul, which had rare bipartisan support. It shortens some drug sentences and expands rehabilitation programs for prisoners. As Jim Axelrod reports, it is all about second chances. After six and a half years in federal prison for selling drugs, Rosa Concha now helps recently released felons transition. Don't get discouraged. You know, one interview might not go well, but we'll keep pushing. At the Exodus Transitional Community in New York City, helping launch post-prison lives with job searches and counseling. What we do is keep people from going back to prison. What is our resume for? Julio Medina runs the agency. We cannot continue to characterize people as Americans by the worst moment of their lives. It's not just the boost in funding his agency is expected to get from the new law. It's the sweeping change in how we punish. Thousands of well-behaved inmates getting early releases. Others seeing their sentences reduced. And drug offenders getting treatment. For the longest time, we've thought we should lock as many people up as we can for as long as we can and do nothing with them while they're gone. And somehow that would make us safer. If Kevin Ring sounds like just another liberal, well, he's not. He's a former Republican congressional aide turned lobbyist. Did a year and a half in prison for corruption and wire fraud. While I was there, I saw people who had made mistakes um, deserved a second chance, but while they were in prison, they were getting no rehabilitation, no programming. Ring, who now runs a sentencing reform nonprofit that pushed for the law, says the bipartisan support rests on one fact 113 million Americans know a family member who's been incarcerated. This is a problem that we thought that was confined maybe to some communities, but it's affecting a lot of communities. The law the president signed today covers only federal prisoners, roughly 9% of the nation's inmates. Large-scale reform will be a matter of change at the state and local level. Yeah, such, such an interesting story. It makes you think. Second chances. All right, Jim, thank you. Oh, all these videos just, they end with something just weird. Oh, oh. Second chances makes you think. Oh, just, anyway, I'm really a little bit of my cynicism there, but... Uh, all right. Um, reentry programs, bipartisan support. We, we, there's a lot of people, there's a lot of recognition now that, that there are problems in the criminal justice system um, and that the, a better way to uh, prevent crime isn't to just try to lock people up for forever uh, because the reality of our, our, our criminal justice system, the way it's set up in the U.S. Constitution, is that we're not going to eventually most people are going to get out of jail. I think of the, the statistic is of all the people who are currently in prison, up, up, over 98% of them are eventually going to not be in prison anymore. And so it's just, it's just, it's a reality that we have to deal with. And when people get out of prison, do we want them to be more or less ready to uh, be contributing, to, to hold down a job and, 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 you know, pay their taxes and, and, and do all the things they got to do. Um, so... All right, that's where we're at. Uh, the last thing I want to show you is just uh, pictures of my reentry program. And there I am with one of my guys getting a GED. That's our GED class. We did art classes. 
there is actually a good amount of evidence. We did a garden class, we did a writing class, a creative endeavors like that uh, can help reduce recidivism. Um, the idea is that you're trying to increase agency. So remember back in our first chapter, uh, our first video, we, we talked about the idea of structure versus agency, and the question was posed like structure or agency. And the answer is both, right? There, there are social structures that influence our decisions and influence our behavior and how we see the world. And then we also have uh, a certain amount of agency to individual agency and ability that's an ability to navigate those social structures and do what we want to do, uh, as opposed to what sort of the, the culture wants us to do or what society wants us to do. Um, so the idea with reentry programs is we're trying to increase individual agency. So we actually find the creative endeavors uh, can help do that. But the challenging part about rehabilitation and reentry is that what works for one person isn't necessarily going to work for another person. Some people really need uh, addiction treatment. Some people really need mental health treatment for anger issues. Uh, some people are like classic examples of, of, of differential association. Um, and I see people go into jail or there were one person before they went to prison, they come out of prison uh, even more determined that they are a criminal and they live a certain lifestyle. And there's that labeling theory that we talked about or that the book talked about. Uh, we haven't touched much on those theories, um, but they're, I mean, they're there. Uh, yeah, you can read about them and they're, they're, they're worthwhile. But again, they're coming from all sorts of different places and all these different perspectives and theories of why people behave criminally and, and how they and how that happens. Uh, all of them hold some truth. So the idea with a, with a reentry program and a rehabilitation program is that you've got to you've got to individualize the program um, and you've got to give individuals what each what each person may need, uh, which makes it really challenging. Right. It makes it really challenging to do some sort of nationwide a program that's just going to work for everybody because what's going to work for everybody is is, is going to change and be different. So, um, last picture. There's a bunch. There, that was my first cohort. Uh, you notice I, I'm in rural Tennessee uh, here. So, um, and 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 the county we were in, uh, we were 99.8 percent white in that county. It's just there aren't any, there are very few people of color in that in, in that county. So there are no people of color in the jail, or usually no people of color in the jail. Anyway, um, so there's, there's just this distinct monochromatic effect to this picture, uh, but that's 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 the nature of, of where we were. Um, but there they all are. That was my first cohort of uh, folks who who went through anger management. They went through a soft skills employee employee job skills program. A couple of them got their GEDs as well. Um, and a couple of these guys are are back in jail. A couple of them are doing well. Some of them I've, I've kept in touch with and are still doing well. Um, and then one in particular never got out of jail. He got he caught some extra charges while he was still incarcerated, and he got ship, shipped out to uh, the state prison. It's this is this is this is an evolving science, right? It's a it's, it's a changing thing, and we're learning as we go. Um, but anyway, this is uh, this is that's 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 rehabilitation and reentry. That's criminal justice reform, um, and what we're trying to accomplish there. Um, so uh, that's what's cool. That's what I'm looking forward to about the rest of this semester. We we've spent a lot of time doing what I think is kind of boring sociology stuff in the first half of the semester. Now we get to look more at some real some real world stuff and how it affects policy and decisions and. Uh, um anyway uh so i'm excited about the rest of the semester um anyway hope you enjoyed the video it went longer than i anticipated so i apologize for that but uh thanks let me know if you have any questions don't forget to do your course evaluations don't forget to do your uh deviance assignment due march 22nd and then don't forget about that discussion board that's due this week this sunday uh march 15th all right y'all have a great day